Uh, I am thankful to Hormone India and Dr. Mayur for this opportunity. And I have been given a topic which is quite relevant in practice in our country, that is iatrogenic cushings. So I am going to talk in next 20 minutes and what we keep seeing in day-to-day -day practice and how to manage the patients who are having iatrogenic cushings. So this will be my agenda for next 15 minutes, 20 minutes rather, when to suspect. What are the clinical manifestations for iatrogenic cushings? And obviously iatrogenic means etiology has to be some drug induced. So let us talk of, we all know about steroids, but what other than steroids which can cause iatrogenic cushings? How it differs from Cushing syndrome, how to diagnose iatrogenic Cushing's and then how to do a management and what are the usual steps of management we should follow when we are managing a patient with iatrogenic Cushing's. Now the first point when to suspect. Obviously it's too simple that somebody who is on a steroid therapy since long and who is looking like Cushingoid, it is a straightforward diagnosis. But it is not always true. Many times in our country, many patients are receiving indigenous medication and, and we are not aware that they are taking steroids in the form of indigenous medication. And in fact, in my clinical experience, I believe that that is the most common cause of iatrogenic Cushing's. So look for clinical symptoms and signs for cortisol excess in the patient. If they are present, then we have to inquire about the history of steroid intake. Now many times patients are suffering from illnesses where steroids are often used to treat like vitiligo, rheumatoid arthritis, myopathy, etc. If there is an obvious case, we know that this patient is receiving a steroid therapy and patient is cushing white, then, then there is no issue in diagnosis. But when we are not aware, then we have to go into depth, inquire about the history of indigenous medication and, and doesn't matter for many reasons, patients are receiving steroids, which we are seeing very common in our practice. Now, these are the standard features for Cushing syndrome, which we are going to discuss. But important thing here in iatrogenic Cushing is this syndrome is developing because of external or exogenous steroid intake. And that's why there is an absence of androgenic and mineralocorticoid effects, which we very often see in patients with Cushing syndrome. And we all know that in Cushing syndrome, the cortisol will be high. Here it will be opposite. Here the cortisol will be suppressed somebody who looks like Cushing but the cortisol levels are low that means we are dealing with a iatrogenic Cushing and these are the well-known clinical features of Cushing syndrome we all know and when a patient will come to us for Cushing obviously we will have to manage their obesity we will have to manage their osteoporosis and and the syndrome and the features because of cortisol axis since it is a hydrogenic Cushing, as I told earlier, the symptoms which are absent will be androgenic and mineralocorticoid effects and hence these patients won't have hypertension, hirsutism, acne, etc. These are the features which are very often present in patients with Cushing syndrome. Then the issue of hypokalemia is also less frequent in patients with iatrogenic Cushing, which is quite common in Cushing syndrome endogenous because of the mineralocorticoid effect, which comes from endogenous production of cortisol. While the cortisol or the steroids which we are using for therapeutic purposes like dexamethasone, metnisolone, prednisolone, they have very less mineralocorticoid effects and same thing for villilizing effects. Rather, few other things like benign intracranial hypertension, glaucoma, subcapsular cataract, 
avascular necrosis. These are more commonly seen features with exogenous crushings. And in COVID era, many doctors have seen the patients who had avascular necrosis of bone, including the facial bones, maxillary bones, and etc. etc. Many, many such cases had seen during COVID era because of the effect of steroids exogenous on the bone. So any route of steroid administration has been reported to cause pushing oral and injectable being most common. Then there are drugs which can inhibit the cytochrome 450 pathway like antifungals, voriconazole, itraconazole, ritonavir. And if the patients are receiving these drugs and simultaneously steroids, so the steroid potency will increase by many times. And that's how they can cause exogenous cushion. Magistrol effect in high dose of medroxyprogesterone acetate also works like a glucocorticoid and can cause exogenous cushion. And obviously, steroids being given in form of herbal and alternative therapies. And I feel in my clinical experience, this is one of the most common cause. Now, somebody who is receiving a steroid as a pharmacotherapy for treatment of some disease, then we have to look for the three major factors. What is the dose? Any patient who is receiving more than 25 milligram or equivalent of prednisolone is at a risk for cushion. Higher is the frequency. Somebody receiving just morning dose versus somebody receiving twice daily, thrice daily. Higher is the frequency, more chances of iatrogenic crushings and its consequences. And longer is the duration. Generally, we say that a steroid duration of more than 20 days predisposes a patient for iatrogenic cushing, but somebody receiving a very high dose with a high frequency, even after more than five days of therapy, there can be uh, iatrogenic cushing features appear, but generally it is more than 20 days of therapy. What happens when patients receive exogenous steroids? We all know the negative feedback loop. And because of that, the whole adrenal axis is suppressed. So the CRH, which is coming from hypothalamus, goes to pituitary and leads to secretion of ACTH from corticotroph. And then is, this ACTH goes to adrenal, where it works on zona fasciculata and reticularis. And from there, it is causing secretion of cortisol and a small amount of adrenal androgen, that is GHEA. That's what is going on. And somebody who is receiving exogenous steroid in whatever form for a longer duration, there is a full suppression of axis from CRH to ACTH to cortisol. And if the duration of therapy is longer, this suppression can remain for one year. And we have to remember that the adrenal gland is last to recover. First pituitary hypothalamus recovers and adrenal gland recovers in the last. So the important feature here is iatrogenic Cushing is a duality. It is a dual disease because patient is having Cushing as well as endogenous secondary adrenal insufficiency because of these exogenous steroids. And hence, the steps for management are very important. We have to ask this question first. Can we withdraw steroids? If yes, good. We have to follow a protocol for steroid withdrawal. But before that, we have to document the adrenal function. So we have to slowly withdraw the steroid. Once we reach to a lower dose of steroid, we can make it alternate day. And now we have to document that patient as an adequate adrenal reserve. And for that, we have to omit a steroid for 24 hours and then do the test. If the adrenal reserve is sufficient, we can withdraw glucocorticoids. And we have to remember that for next one year, we have to give them a short course of glucocorticoid during the periods of stress. But if the glucocorticoid cannot be withdrawn, then we have no choice. We have to manage all the consequences of cortisol excess. And there, the most important is 
obesity and osteoporosis if patient has developed diabetes hyperglycemia so now there is no specific issue here we have to manage whatever disorder they are having with the cortisol excess and that's what we had seen many such patients during covid era including the complications and consequences because of steroid excess so here it will be medical issue dependent management for iatrogenic cushing and there the top three are obesity diabetes and osteoporosis for example let me show you one case which i saw a few days ago 38 year female obesity normal bp comes to me with small joint pain etc but her major objective for consultation was swelling on the body and obesity so she thought that she is having some thyroid problem that's why she consulted on on history she denies any history of any indigenous medication and that's quite common she gives a complaint of 8 kg weight gain and looks like cushing oid rest of the tests are normal as shown here now in my experience many times when patient deny history of intake of indigenous medication is still you should do a cortisol test and prove that you are not dealing with iatrogenic cushing and that's what we did in this case and her cortisol was undetectable and then we discussed and explored further and then came to know and now she disclosed what she is receiving in form of some ayurvedic powder etc this is quite common in our country so as far as the approach is concerned we should first inquire does the patient has iatrogenic cushing one is history is very important here and then if you measure cortisol and if it is less than 3 microgram in the morning patient is most likely having exogenous cushing i already discussed a specific management of the clinical abnormality whichever are present which you have to do as i told earlier it is a duality so we have to look for is there any feature of steroid withdrawal syndrome because many times this patient will stop these medication and come to us with these symptoms anorexia nausea vomiting myalgia a lot of symptoms and a shot of steroid will make them full recover these are the adrenal withdrawal syndrome and secondly we have to look for adrenal reserve is the reserve adequate in these patients and for that we will have to gradually those who are having adrenal withdrawal syndrome and those who have secondary adrenal insufficiency first to do a cortisol replacement make them asymptomatic once they are fine now gradually reduce the substitution dose and once we have come to a dose of say hydrocortisone 10 to 15 mg per day now omit the hydrocortisone for 24 hour and then do a test for adrenal reserve Suppose in the test, the cortisol is more than 18 microgram. We can do just a morning cortisol initially. If the cortisol is good, fine, nothing to be done. You can stop substitution. But if the cortisol remains too low, less than 3, continue it. And if the cortisol is between 3 to 18, now we need to do a dynamic test. And in dynamic test, if the response is more than 18, we can stop substitution and explain the patient for next one year if you develop any big infection fever medical emergency you should be covered with the steroid during emergency if the cortisol is suboptimal then we have to continue substitution and repeat the test subsequently what are the tests for adrenal reserve there are so many tests one is i'll just give you a glimpse one is a insulin hypoglycemia test which is considered the best test because it does not only test adrenal reserve it is testing the whole hypothalamo pituitary axis where we give a insulin dose and create hypoglycemia under our supervision and if the cortisol goes more than 18 few books or guidelines talk more than 20 then you should consider that the patient has an adequate adrenal reserve Another test is metirapone test. This is the protocol. CRH test, IV CRH is given here. This is the protocol. All these two things are not available in our country, so I'm not going to discuss them. And this is what we have very commonly available. Now it is available. That is the short ACTH 
test where 250 microgram of ACTH should be given as a single shot IV and collect the cortisol sample at 30 to 60 minutes. If the cortisol is more than 18, in any of the two sample patient is having adrenal reserve, I generally prefer a single test is 30 minutes because it makes it more cost effective for my patients. And then another test which is unfortunately not available but it is more specific than the high dose uh, short ACTH or cyanectin test where rather than 250 microgram, one microgram is given because 250 is really a supraphysiologic dose. So this gives us a real test of adrenal reserve, but it is unfortunately not available. So how to manage iatrogenic questions? Let me come to the most important takeaway points. One, we must suspect and diagnose and should remember that many patients are using steroids without their knowledge. So if the somebody is already on a steroid therapy, say for rheumatoid arthritis, since one year and now coming to us for hydrogenic cushions, the story is different. But somebody not aware that they are receiving a steroid and now they are sitting in front of us, we will have to suspect. Somebody already on steroids, then they should be tapered in the right way. Gradually reduce the dose. Once we come to a dose, say around 5 to 10 milligram equivalent of prednisolone, make it alternate day first. Then gradually reduce this further. And once patient is on 2.5 milligram alternate day and comfortable, then we can withdraw it. As I told earlier, it's a common entity in India. I don't have the prevalence number because, because it's not possible to have these kind of data when patients are receiving in form of indigenous medicine and hence high index of suspicion is needed and it's a dual disease so we have to simultaneously manage the metabolic and bone problems happening due to Cushing as well as adrenal insufficiency and the short synectin test is the most preferred test which is easily available now again earlier there was a shortage of this uh, product but now we have the short synectin or synectin molecule available for the test. Insulin hypoglycemia test is the gold standard, but it is a risky test. So it is better to go with a short synectin test and that's what we prefer. We must give a steroid substitution till the adrenal recovery is complete. And for that, we have to do a periodic cortisol measurement and as and when required a synectin test. And when patient so adrenal gland recovers fully, we can stop the cortisol or the steroid doses and we should inform this patient about steroid coverage during stress. These are the few important things to remember when we are dealing a patient with iatrogenic cushions. Many a times what I see that these patients steroids are suddenly withdrawn and we are not taking care of their adrenal insufficiency and then that creates a medical emergency and these patients are admitted in shock and in many other medical complications. So we have to understand that iatrogenic Cushing is always a dual disease and accordingly we should manage. Thank you very much.